thank you to our panel. It's such an honor for Bickle to have a panel of such esteemed colleagues joining us for this event today. And thank you also to our audience. We have some uh, attendees here in the room with us. We also have a very, very large online audience. Um, I was looking earlier and the geographical reach is uh, very impressive indeed. Uh, we have people calling in from every continent, perhaps except Antarctica, as Mark uh, pointed out, but we'll try for that. Uh, and in terms of countries, uh, I can see here Sierra Leone, Liberia, Nigeria, Brazil, uh, Pakistan, India, USA, Switzerland, and many, many more. So thank you so much to everyone online for tuning in. And I think this really is indicative of the strength of interest that so many people have, particularly in the global south, in the success of this um, WHO pandemic treaty. And really, it's little wonder why, when we look at the inequalities that uh, we saw during the COVID pandemic, particularly with respect to inequitable access to vaccines and medicines and PPE. Uh, Professor Borchi, who is uh, on the panel with us today, very kindly spoke at another Bickle event back in 2020, where we frankly addressed COVID-19 and international law, what went wrong? Very bold title and very apt one, unfortunately. Uh, we will look at some of those inequities again today, considering why equity was in such short supply during the COVID pandemic, and uh, also why uh, nationalism seemed too often to triumph over humanitarianism. And uh, But we're not just going to focus on um, what went wrong today. Today is more about looking at uh, how we can put things right for the future. And uh, in that regard, we're going to look at how equity can be embedded into the WHO pandemic treaty. I understand that the negotiators are in Geneva uh, this week, as we speak, negotiating this treaty. So um, let's hope that they hear what we have to say here today and that we have uh, a treaty guided by principles of equity and values of humanitarianism. So I'll hand over to uh, our chair, Dr. Stephanie Schweitzer. And um, yes, over to the experts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, and just to reiterate, Anthony's thanks for everybody in the room, our panelists and those joining us online. And um, we're very excited to see everybody. So a particular uh, focus of our discussions today will be how pathogen sharing has become a key issue in international negotiations on the so-called pandemic treaty negotiations being conducted under the auspices of the World Health Organization. And as Anthony indicated, these negotiations are ongoing as we speak. They are designed to ensure that equity is embedded in global responses to any future global pandemic. I'm sure you all remember the debates during COVID on access to vaccines and other medical countermeasures and questions as to whether the distribution of these vital resources was equitable on global terms. Pathogen sharing and the sharing of medical countermeasures and vaccines are central to the issue of equity in the pandemic treaty negotiations, as well as other negotiations ongoing within the World Health Organization on revising a set of international regulations called the International Health Regulations. Today, I'm delighted to have four very distinguished speakers and a discussant to drill down into the issue of pathogen sharing, its link with equity and the ongoing negotiations within the World Health Organization. Before I introduce each of our speakers, however, I would like to acknowledge the kind support of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, which has enabled this event to take place. I'll now pass over just to giving a bit of an introduction to each of our speakers, and then I will let them speak because I know you're all here for them. It is my pleasure to introduce Jean-Luc Liberci. He is a professor of international law at the Graduate Institute of International Development Studies in Geneva. He's also a senior scholar at the O'Neill Center on National and Global Health Law 
in Georgetown. Before his appointment at the Graduate Institute, Jean-Luc has served as in the legal office of the World Health Organization and was its legal counsel from 2005 to 2016. During his time at the WHO, he was kept rather busy. He was involved in the negotiation and implementation of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, revision and the implementation of the international health regulations, which we will talk about today, as well as the WHO's response to the H1N1 influenza pandemic in 2009 to 10, and the 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa. So a busy time. We are excited to have Jean-Luc with us to share his expertise, not just on the pandemic treaty, but also on the international health regulations. Following Jean-Luc, we will have Michelle Rourke. She is a CSIRO Synthetic Biology Future Science Research Fellow at Griffiths University's Law Future Centers, where she researches the global regulation of access to genetic resources for Australian synthetic and for the Australian synthetic biology community. In her previous life, she was a captain in the Australian Army, where she worked as a senior scientific research fellow for 10 years. She holds a PhD in international law from Griffiths Law School, and her thesis examined how international access and benefit sharing laws under the Convention on Biological Diversity and the World Health Organization's Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Framework impact access to virus samples and associated genetic sequence data, a topic which will be of particular relevance to today's discussions. Following Michelle, we will then turn to Mark Eccleston Turner, who's beside me to my left, looking rather fetching in a Beatles-inspired outfit. He is a senior lecturer at King's College London, where he works within the Global Health and Social Medicine Department. He has worked for a number of years on legal issues pertaining to pathogen sharing and is currently finishing a book on legal aspects of pandemic influenza for Oxford University Press. He is an academic fellow of Middle Temple and has worked as a legal consultant to the WHO, as well as providing advice to the UK government on issues related to international law and infectious diseases. He holds a PhD from the University of Manchester on legal responses to influenza, and is obviously very qualified to speak to us today. Following Mark, we will have Elisa Margera, one of my colleagues at the University of Strathclyde, where she is a professor and also director of the UKRI funded One Ocean Hub. This is a global interdisciplinary research collaboration across the UK, Africa, South Pacific and the Caribbean, as well as incorporating UN agencies and other international partners, which is pioneering research on human rights and the marine environment to support fair and inclusive decision making for a healthy ocean whereby people and the planet can flourish. We are looking forward to hearing some of her thoughts and ideas with regards to the application of equity within the pandemic treaty. Following each of their contributions, we will then have a discussant, John Harrington, who is sitting to the far left of me. He is a professor of global health law at the University of Cardiff. He has published a very large body of work in this area and co-directs the Cardiff um, Law and Justice Centre, a research centre at based at Cardiff University. He has a particular interest in the impact of the regimes of global health law on national legal systems, and in particular on the processes by which they are received into developing country jurisdictions. We're very excited to have his thoughts on each of the conversations today. So without much further ado, I'm going to turn to Jean-Luc, um, who will be giving a presentation, and I should say just from a housekeeping perspective, there will be lots of time after for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. I hope you can hear me. Um, it's the second time that I'm invited by Biko, so it's quite an honor for me. As, uh, <clears throat> as was recalled earlier, the first one was about what went wrong. And today we hope to talk about what can go right in the next few years as we negotiate these new rules on, on pandemics. Let me um, share my screen. 
I hope, I hope you can see it. Um, so Stephanie has asked me to give a bit of an introduction to the uh, current processes on uh, negotiating a pandemic accord and amending international health regulations, in particular for people in the audience that have not followed all the intricacies of what has been going on in WHO for the last couple of years. So I'll keep it kind of basic. I'll talk a bit about the history and the process, but also what are the issues being discussed and what are the prospects for the for next uh, year or two. Starting, just a couple of words on, on the ecosystem. So the uh, proposal of a pandemic treaty has not come out of nowhere, uh, but is part of the reaction to the, the failures, the challenges, the gaps that the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed, has confirmed, and so on. And I will not take too long, but I think it's important to, to see it a bit in a broader context. And you can see uh, the slides on uh, the slides on the screen about what I think are the most important point. Governance issues, uh, WHO has not been seen as enough in such a complex issue. So what are the organization, what other institutions are there? Do we need new institutions? <clears throat> Question of power and control uh, that I think is something that we continue to find in the next few years, in particular, the tension between global and politically probably a more legitimate organization like WHO versus political clubs like G20, G7, but also interestingly, the role of regional organizations, the European Union, the African Union has been a leader in the question of access to vaccine and the question of uh, better distribution manufacturing capacity. So the regional organization, but with a global reach for the messages. Obviously the question of financing has been looming large, the money was not enough. We are still in a development financing model. So that proved to be, uh, I think, a particular challenge, in particular to finance uh, the, the development of core capacities or national capacities in developing countries. Obviously, equity and solidarity, I don't need to, 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 to tell you what we have been living in the, next, in the last two, three years, but that's obviously at the center of the current negotiation, and I will say something in, in a minute. Uh, also, the balancing of public versus private authority. Uh, I have the feeling that we have been ruled by pharmaceutical company in the last two, three years. And so there is clearly an imbalance between, uh, you know, the, the regulatory and the sovereign powers of states versus the sheer power of pharmaceutical companies that held the key to a survival to a certain extent. Human rights, obviously, one of the disasters of COVID and the importance of guaranteeing both dignity and livelihood. And finally, the need for legal rules. The fact that we need shared global rules um, of a legal nature, how to prepare and respond to future shocks like COVID. And so here comes the so-called pandemic treaty. It was largely an initiative of the European Council at the end of 2020. Uh, Charles Michel, the president of the Council, converted pretty quickly Dr. Tedros, the director general of WHO, that became a vocal advocate, but also sort of a coalesced a coalition of countries that called themselves the friends of the treaty. They went beyond just the European context and has formed a critical mass of support for the idea of a treaty. I must say at the beginning and for almost for a year, there was a lot of ambivalence. Why do we need a treaty? We have the international health regulations. Why don't we strengthen the regulation? We have other instruments that talk about prevention, talks about supply chain, talks about human rights and so on. Why don't we look at those regimes? Why do we need something new with all the negotiating pain of a new treaty. And in particular, there was a, a lot of suspicion on the motives of the European Union that it became the champion of multilateralism, but at the same time being totally intransigent in the discussion in WTO about the waiver of intellectual property right on COVID-19 vaccine. So there was quite some suspicions. This is like a digression to distract us from the real uh, priorities. And so the discussions in WHO uh, were quite confused, I must say, and also divisive. The United States was initially very hostile to the idea of a new treaty, uh, basically invested a lot of political capital in the international health regulations. Many global South countries, in particular African countries, are also skeptic. Uh, China was very defensive for obvious reasons. But in particular, uh, my, in my opinion, there has been a lack of a uh, initial 
discussion, conversation. What are we talking about? Do we need a treaty? And if so, why? Do we share a consensus about some basics of what this treaty should do? These have not taken place. There was a lot of rush, a lot of pressure. We need to move quickly. And I think now we are paying uh, the absence of a better discussion at the very beginning of the process. And finally, the choice of WHO as a forum. This could have gone to the United Nations, as far as we know. But there was a clear consensus that these had to be framed as human health, not as trade, not as security, not as finance, but the protection of human health. And that frame is driving the discussion now. So two words about the process. Um, we have two tiers and we see the pandemic instrument, the negotiation were launched in December 2021 uh, with a very ambitious deadline for adoption by May 2024. So we are less than a year away. Is it a treaty? If you look at the um, WHO documents, they talk about instruments, accord, they have this funny acronym CA+. Why don't we call it a treaty? For two reasons. The first is some countries want to keep the options open uh, until the last moment. And second, to leave a comfort zone to the United States. They would have had political difficulties internally if they had committed themselves to a treaty process. So we are sort of, it's a treaty that doesn't care to call its name. The method of work have been interesting, very bottom up. Um, gathering um, various rounds of uh, comments and proposals from states, from stakeholders, from experts, and so on. So really bo bottom up. And with the production of uh, successive uh, drafts by the Bureau of the Inter Intergovernmental Negotiating Body, the Bureau is the officer, there are six officers. And so they come up with constant new text. The last one was issued at the end of May, and it should form the basis of negotiation but uh, there is some quite some resistance because some countries don't see the proposal reflected in the draft and so in a way they uh, they sit on the fence they say yes but we want to see our priorities better reflected and then finally the question of uh, participation by other stakeholder it's been a relatively um, transparent process, but there's a lot of discontent, in particular from NGOs and um, civil society organizations that are excluded from the real negotiation. But that, frankly, is not, not, not nothing unusual. When you really come to brass knuckle negotiation, member states don't want external scrutiny. And so this good part of the work may takes care behind closed doors. Uh, people ask, is it realistic? Are we really going to make it by 2014, 2024? I'll say something at the end about this. The second tier that makes the whole process quite dysfunctional is that the uh, Health Assembly has also launched amendments to the international health regulations. I hope that you are at least superficially familiar with the IHR, because I don't have the time to go through it, but basically they are a binding legal instrument grounded in the WHO constitution, um, and uh, differently from treaties, they are what we call the opt-out instruments. One has been adopted by the Health Assembly. It, it comes into force for all member states of WHO, except those that opt out. They either reject or subject to, to certain conditions, file reservation. So there's a strong bias in favor of universality. Pulling out, it's a heavy political responsibility. So the uh, why uh, these parallel processes that frankly are consuming a lot of energy that was largely a us initiative born out of the initial hostility to the treaty process and basically um, calling the bluff of member states in ignoring the ihr so the us uh, jump started this process in early 2022 proposing their own amendments um, that had to be considered by the Health Assembly. So what happened is that there were technical amendments to facilitate the entry into force of future amendments. But in particular, they opened the Pandora box because other member states basically said, why the US and not us? If you have amendments, let's open it to everybody. And so I think that naively some countries thought that the amendments that would come from other member states would be kind of technical to strengthen what the IHR is about, because it is about preparedness, containment, and detection. Instead, many countries uh, have 14 countries, but representing more than half of the membership of WHO, propose far reaching amendments that go way beyond the current scope of the IHR. And so, uh, some of the main issues, you can see them in the bullet at the bottom of the screen. And so 
in a way, it created this uh, these, these parallel processes that are quite dysfunctional because you have um, overlapping proposals in both texts, for example, access to medicine, for example, uh, management of intellectual property, for example, the question of one health, pathogen sharing, and, and so on. So why? this overlap. In good part, I think, again, in reaction to the United States, because many countries, in particular the African countries, but also Indonesia, India, Bangladesh, so some of the Asian middle income countries, they knew perfectly well that the US will not ratify anytime soon any treaty. And so basically they they put all their priorities also in the amendments to the IHR, trying to get a deal there, or at least using it as heavy bargaining chips to satisfy the priorities somewhere. And so that has created quite a difficult process because one of the things that um, is keeping my, my diplomatic colleagues awake at night, how to divide the issues, what should go where, are they criteria, are they just political, are they objective, and so on. So it's quite a heavy process with different negotiating modalities because it's negotiating raw text in the IHR, and while negotiating general drafts that come from the Bureau of the IMB in the other process. So it's a difficult, uh, different approaches. And obviously, there's a lot of political positioning and posturing. The United States has become much more engaged in the treaty negotiation. Uh, President Biden appointed a, a senior diplomat uh, heading the negotiation, so that gives you a sense of the political importance also for the US. The European Union has taken quite a divergent approach. They come with really different proposals that compete with some of, the, uh, of, of those on the table. But also, there are different negotiating tactics. Some countries say we need to go fast, otherwise how do we make it by 2024? Let's start digging in the text. Other countries say no, we need to understand better uh, position. So as a result, there's not been yet really textual negotiations. And in part, it's I think uh, some tactics to create tension until the last moment to get compromise, to get concessions. Um, in particular from global south countries. So, but it's, it's quite, the, the clock is ticking very loud. So. I talked about process and politics and history, but what issues, what are we talking about? So I don't have the time to go in details through uh, the, the, the various topics and they're not non-exhaustive. Um, but just to give you a sense, they really cover a broad spectrum of concern from real prevention, in particular One Health, basically how to reduce the risk of uh, zoonotic spillover, of diseases spilling from animals uh, to humans, and that's something driven by environmental problems. The question of health system and core capacities, there has been a major failure, not only from developing countries during COVID, they need to strengthen the mechanism how to start the system of alert, the countries to use due diligence and good faith, giving more power to WHO, even being like a kind of policeman. The question of genetic sequencing, pathogen and, and, and benefit sharing, my colleagues will go in depth into it. The question of travel and trade measures that have been a major, major irritant and a major block in the last couple of years. The question of equity, I'll say something about that. So you can see that they go from a response to equity, to preparedness, to prevention, and to governance. They cover quite a broad range of issues. So equity is at the center of the negotiation. Equity has been presented as a principle, and it's difficult to talk against equity, but it's clearly a proxy for political requests from Global South countries. And these requests are sort of fleshed out on a number of points. First of all, there's a lot of uh, push to include the concept of common but differentiated responsibilities in the text. As you know, these come from environmental law, in particular from climate change law, um, but there's a lot of resistance from global North countries because it, it implies almost like a responsibility on what has happened. So some people say it doesn't make sense in a pandemic context. Uh, actually, most pathogens come from, from the global south. So there's a lot of um, 
of negotiation, how to reflect that point, that there are differentiated capacities and responsibilities without uh, reproducing that language. The second, which has a really the central point, is how to ensure equitable access to what we call countermeasures, vaccine, diagnostics, therapeutics, protective equipment, and, and so on. And these, the cracks of the matter, because it, there is a lot of distrust from the global south to the global north, based on what we experienced during COVID-19. And that, I think, is proving a major uh, stumbling block in the negotiation. Equally, from the transfer of technologies, particular African countries say, we don't want to just be purchasers. We don't want to depend on international assistance. We want to manufacture our vaccines. We want to be self-sufficient. And for that, we need transfer of technology. We need capacity building. We need financing. We need a better management of intellectual property. And so here, obviously, there's a big role of industry. How to commit the industry? More, many of uh, of these issues depend on the attitude of companies, not so much on the attitude of governments. Is it reasonable to think of a very regulatory approach, or are we relying on agreements with the, with the industry? This is very much at the center of the negotiations right now. Obviously, intellectual property is a consequence of all these discussions and questions about what can a WHO treaty do? Uh, can a WHO treaty somehow diverge from the TRIPS agreement in the context of WTO? You don't want to create conflicts of obligation. So how can the two go together? Financing again, uh, both for national capacities, but also for what we call global public goods, how to finance research and development, how to finance uh, allocation and purchase of, of countermeasures. Who pays? Who contributes? There is a lot of um, emphasis on national financing. Not everything can depend on the generosity of donors. There has to be something that reflects the investment of each country, regardless of the level of development in pandemic uh, preparedness and response. And why is pathogen and benefit sharing part of this agenda? And again, I don't want to steal the thunder from my colleagues, in good part because many pathogens come from the, from the global south. And so there, there is a sense that they have something that the north wants, and they want something in return, which is, again, guarantees of access to medicine and so on and so forth. So they become really part of the central ingredients of the uh, equity agenda. Finally, I leave you with some open question. The first, again, uh, people are agonizing on this, what are the pros and cons of a treaty versus the IHR? Um, as Stephanie recalled, the IMB is meeting this week, the working group on the IHR is meeting next week, and Friday afternoon and Monday morning, we'll have a joint meeting of the two bodies to try to see how they work together, how synergy and complementarity can be implemented more practically. But in my view, there are no metaphysical criteria on how to divide the text. It's a question of effectiveness, political realism, and um, in a way, global public goods versus club goods. I spoke about equity, but obviously, as I said, there are limits to what the treaty can do. Um, also, from a content point of view, WHO has a mandate on, on, on human health. You can stretch it a lot, but not infinitely. If you talk about your, um, animal health, environmental problems, uh, intellectual property, supply chain, uh, can WHO regulate all this? How do you bridge WHO and the, the treaty with other regimes, with other institutions like WTO, like FAO, like the Human Rights Institution? This is a topic that, to my knowledge, not really been discussed until now. Human rights are strangely absent from the, from the text of the treaty to the great chagrin of many civil society organizations. And so there's a lot of discussion on what to do, whether there should be a push to reintroduce human rights language in the treaty, or at least to human rights proof what we have so that the, the implementation will not lead to unnecessary breaches of human rights. And finally, so if you, if you take a step back and you oversimplify what is going on, maybe, you have two main blocks, two main priorities. Health security, there is a priority for the North. We want pathogens, we want information, we want to make sure that countries do the job in notifying outbreaks. We want to protect ourselves, we want prevention. And the global south that wants equity, that wants access to medicine, as I said, financing, transfer of technology, and so on. These are clearly different bottom lines and very visible. So the challenge will be if there is a space for a package deal. And there will have to be 
uh, an element of trust, because if the total mistrust, we won't go very far. Finally, what can be the outcome? Um, supposedly, everything has to be done by May next year. Some people start blinking. They say, we cannot make it. But there is a reluctance to go into 2025 because of the US elections. If, God forbid, we have a Trump number two or another uh, presidential uh, Republican presidency, the US may pull out, may torpedo the whole thing at the last moment. And so there is a lot of push in finishing the negotiation within 2024, maybe at the end with a separate meeting. So either we have a good outcome in, 20, in May 2024, scenario one, hardly feasible, or we skip to 2025 or the end of the year, or my concern, we need to declare victory somehow. And so having a wishy-washy agreement with the still weak IHR, uh, and then with the idea that this is a long-term process that will have to be developed politically and legally by the governance of the treaty and by WHO. I hope this will not materialize, but again, uh, I think that the three scenarios are quite open. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will stop here and I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, Sean Luca. That was excellent. Um, I'm now going to ask my colleague uh, Michelle Roark um, to put her slides online and begin her presentation. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm up and running. Excellent. Um, okay, so thank you very much to the British Institute of International and Comparative Law for having us here today to talk about this really important uh, issue. Um, before I start, I just want to let you know that I'm speaking from Brisbane in Australia, which is the traditional land of the Yagara and Turrbal peoples. So I just like to acknowledge their stewardship of the land and that sovereignty wasn't ceded. Um, Today, I'd like to speak to you about pathogen sharing. So looking um, from a scientific perspective, what it is um, and, and why it's important. And the other thing that I wanna to talk to you about is um, some of the scientific infrastructure that goes on um, behind this process. So all of the infrastructure that supports pathogen sharing. Okay, so let's get right back to basics what are pathogens um so they're essentially any disease causing microorganism like viruses bacteria and even prions um, there are also plant pathogens and animal pathogens so when we talk about pathogen sharing this isn't just a concern of human health it's also about um, agriculture and animal health I'll focus on viruses today um, because they're what I know, but also because they're the type of pathogen that's most likely to emerge or re-emerge in humans um, from animal sources and therefore the most likely to cause the next infectious disease emergency. Um, this is because of how quickly viruses can evolve. And I think one thing that will become pretty obvious in this presentation is that uh, the structure of viruses often determines how they behave and how they evolve and therefore how we as humans interact with them, not just from a human health perspective, but also on a scientific and regulatory basis. So um, the images here are to give you a sense of what we mean when we say pathogen sharing. Um, we talk about this in the abstract when dealing with the pandemic treaty and the international health regulations. But what it usually means is that um, a clinical sample is taken from a host, so an animal or a human, and the, the blood or sputum or what have you is um, used to uh, for scientists to sort of isolate uh, the, the pathogen itself and make sort of a pure sample of the pathogen that they can then put in a vial and send around the world to their collaborators and colleagues. One thing um, I really would like to emphasize today is uh, that not all microorganisms are pathogenic and that um, different 
pathogens have different genetic properties that can make them really useful in various biotechnological applications. So um, for food security and biocontrol, for instance, um, you, viruses are really useful. So working on the principle of my enemy of my, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Um, if you've got a, a pest species that's infecting a, a crop, um, you can find viruses that or other pathogens that can infect that pest species and use that virus or pathogen to um, then keep the population of the pest species manageable. Um, probably my favourite um, example of the use of viruses for practical applications is in waste treatment. So um, in waste treatment plants, quite often have these foaming events which are, are caused by bacterial overgrowth and so what um, what can be done about this is getting a virus that infects the species of bacteria that's overgrowing and causing the foam to occur um, and that way that will keep the, by infecting that bacteria uh, you can keep the population of the bacteria down and and um, stop those foaming events because on windy days um, the foam can cause some issues. Um, viruses are also used in gene therapy and cancer therapies. So you can package um, the um, you can package cancer drugs up into a virus and use that virus to target cancer genes and then release the drug onto the particular um, cells that you want it to treat. So this is to just show that. Um, viruses and other pathogens can have a lot of value in research and development. Not only the physical samples of viruses, I'm just going to say viruses instead of pathogens, but please understand that a lot of this applies to other pathogens like bacteria and fungi. Um, so not just the physical uh, virus samples are valuable. It's also the genetic sequences of um, the virus samples or what's been called the digital sequence information in the access and benefit sharing space. And this is essentially um, the, the genetic code, the A's, G's, T's and C's that make up the genetic code for a virus. And in some instances, this can be used as sort of a recipe to replicate parts of the pathogen or um, even in the entire pathogen in some instances in the lab. Um, so the other thing to note is that not only do different species of viruses have different genetic properties, they also can, um, can exhibit intra-host species or intraspecies genetic variation, as well as intra-host, so within host species generation. Uh, it's within host genetic variation. So if you've got a sample of smallpox, for instance, um, from one place in and one um, geographical location from one person at one time, it's not going to be the same as a, as a smallpox sample from another geographical location isolated at a different time. Um, and so this is why different samples of the same species of virus are valuable. Um, and it's also how you get virus evolution. So in the image, you can see that um, this is representative of the genomes and the various mutations that can accumulate on the genomes. So if you've got various um, genomes of the, the virus circulating within a host, um, You've all heard of survival of the fittest. So the fittest version will be the ones that are transmitted to the next person and survive to create the next generation of viruses. Um, this is why we start to see um, things like uh, variants of concern. So RNA viruses evolve really quickly and there's no proofreading ability. So to demonstrate what I mean by this, we've got everybody's favorite virus, um, the coronavirus, and this has a single strand of RNA as its genome. So these are all the genetic, um, the, the genetic language, so the A's, G's, T's and C's or U's and C's that make up RNA, which is a sister uh, molecule to DNA. And these accumulate um, 
mutations over time and will slowly change. And over time, and, and with coronavirus, the COVID-19 pandemic, we had a lot of people being infected over a short period of time. So you get to see virus evolution sort of happening in real time and the splitting off of various um, phylogenies of viruses so that you get new variants created. So alpha, beta, um, delta viruses. Um, and what you can, what this has also demonstrated to everyone is that the different genomes will create different phenotypes. Um, so different behaviors and different characteristics um, in the actual viruses. Um, and so like I was saying, RNA viruses have no proofreading ability. So they're going to um, accumulate those uh, mutations a lot faster than DNA viruses like smallpox would, for instance. So smallpox, we were able we, as in the scientific community, was able to eradicate smallpox because the virus doesn't change that much over time, nor does it have an animal host. So um, that was a much easier virus to sort of um, contain with um, a vaccine, whereas something like an RNA virus that can change really quickly is much less, um, much harder to handle. Um, so, before the COVID pandemic, the virus that kept everyone in the public health and pandemic space awake at night was the influenza A virus. And in fact, it's still the virus that most people are concerned about when we talk about um, pandemics. So this has um, an RNA genome as well, but it's a slightly different structure. Um, and like I was saying, structure is what the structure of the virus is quite often what influences our interactions with it um, on a scientific and regulatory level. So the influenza A virus has eight segments of RNA. Um, so what can happen is you've got the standard sort of accumulation of mutations that can occur every single year, um, just slow sort of changes that are occurring in the influenza virus that give us our seasonal variants that are occurring year to year. And the reason why the WHO um, has to change their um, vaccine recommendations every year for seasonal influenza. And it's against that background that um, the WHO monitors for changes, bigger changes that could sort of signal that a pandemic strain is, is about to appear. And what can happen when two of the two viruses of the same species infect the one host is you can get um, the virus replicating and creating copies of those eight segments of RNA and then packaging them back up. And it's not particularly careful about which segments that it packages back up. And so it may be taking segments from one virus um, and segments from another virus that make it particularly um, transmissible or virulent in the human population. And perhaps is something that humans haven't seen before. So we're immune, we're um, naive to it. Our immune system is naive and therefore we're looking for um, sort of new pandemic viruses that can emerge through this process as well. So since the early 1950s, in the very early days of the, the World Health Organization, a network of influenza labs have sprung up around the world um, to sort of keep an eye on what was happening with this process of genetic drift the seasonal influenza and the genetic shift, so um, pandemic influenza. Um, and this has sort of happened organically because of the nature of influenza virus. Um, this is the uh, World Health Organization's Global Influenza Surveillance and Response System, um, or at least it's a diagram, <laughs> a schematic diagram of it. So what happens here is you've got the three levels, national, regional, and global. At the national level, you'll have primary healthcare laboratories that collect um, clinical samples of influenza, and then they send those to their national influenza center. The national influenza center will look for any viruses that are particularly interesting and will send those 
to the WHO collaborating centres. So these are regional labs. I think there's seven of them now around the world that are affiliated with the WHO. And they are the ones that are um, sort of doing the higher scientific analysis and looking for any um, examples of um, genetic shift that could indicate that a, a pandemic um, influenza virus is coming. They send um, all of that information to the WHO that also has a panel and makes recommendations on vaccine composition um, every every year for seasonal influenza. And then the vaccine um, candidate viruses are sent from the collaborating centre to vaccine manufacturers. So um, this is the way that this has been happening for about um, five decades until 2006, when um, the Indonesian health minister said that they weren't going to share their influenza viruses with the WHO system anymore. Um, and this was particularly worrying because at the time, um, the H5N1 avian influenza viruses that the world was starting to see, um, it looked like in Indonesia, they were getting the first cases of human to human transmission. And there was also about a 80% um, case fatality rate in those um, human infections. So things were looking pretty dire and the world wanted to get a hold of those, um, those viruses. But the, the Indonesian health minister, Dr. Siti Subhari, said that um, viruses were the sovereign genetic resources of the country of origin under the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, so this, what, what uh, Dr. Subhari said was that disease affected countries, which are usually developing countries, as Gianluca explained, um, quite often this is the site of emergence of a lot of viruses. Um, they provide their information and their specimens and um, their genetic sequence data to the WHO system. The WHO system then passes all of those resources on to, um, to vaccine manufacturers and other, other companies. They create products use um, the patent system to protect those products and then sell them back to developing countries at unaffordable prices. Um, so by withholding their viruses, they wanted to bring the WHO system into compliance with the UN's Convention on Biological Diversity, which is a widely adopted treaty. It's got 196 parties um, with the exception of the Holy See and the US. So there was a huge backlash to this action. Um, lots of commentators said that this was morally comprehensible um, and that viral sovereignty was a dangerous folly and that viruses are not the type of genetic resources that the Convention on Biological Diversity sought to protect. But um, as we remember, we already discussed how valuable viruses can be. And just looking at the demand for these viruses in 2006, 2007 in the scientific community, we can see that they did indeed hold value. And, um, and they are the type of um, things that we want to conserve, just not in human bodies necessarily. So um, many countries said that Indonesia had an obligation under the international health regulations to share their viruses. Um, the international health regulations, the revision of this instrument had been adopted in 2005, but it wouldn't enter into force until 2007, um, mid-2007. We're talking about 2006 and 2007. So this instrument wasn't technically applicable to the situation at hand at the time. Um, but even if it was, um, we can see that um, the international health regulations don't explicitly require that countries share pathogen samples. This all just says that they need to share a whole bunch of information. It doesn't even make it clear if countries have to share their pathogen genetic sequence data. So there was a bit of a stalemate um, and this sort of split very uh, fairly cleanly down the lines of developing countries who wanted transparency in virus sharing and equitable access to affordable vaccines and um, developed countries who are the sites of uh, vaccine manufacturers who wanted free and unencumbered sample sharing. Um, so this led to about four years of negotiations 
um, and the compromise was the PIP framework. So the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Framework adopted in 2011, and um, it essentially recognised that states do have sovereign rights over their influenza viruses, um, but that they should be sharing those, um, those viruses with pandemic potential um, on an equal footing with the WHO sharing vaccines and other benefits. So the PIP framework is what's known as a multilateral access and benefit sharing instrument. So um, the first point here, the sharing of H5N1 and other influenza viruses with human pandemic potential, that's the access side of the bargain. And then the benefit sharing side of the bargain is the second part, vaccines and other countermeasures. Um, this was adopted as a non-binding resolution at the World Health Organ at the World Health Assembly, um, and at the time it was praised as being a particularly innovative legal instrument because it turns um, the non-binding provisions of the World Health Assembly into binding uh, the World Health Assembly's resolution into binding um, terms using standard contracts. So there's the standard material transfer agreement um, that covers any transfers from the National Influenza Centre to the World Health Organization's collaborating centres, and then a second one that asks any um, users of those viruses, third-party users like vaccine manufacturers and diagnostic manufacturers, to contribute benefits um, to be provided and on the next pandemic, um, influenza pandemic, and this is according to their capacities. Um, one thing I should mention is that there's another part of benefit sharing called the partnership contributions. And this is about, um, the this is a voluntary contribution that, pandem that uh, vaccine manufacturers make to the World Health Organization um, that amounts to about half the running costs of the global influenza surveillance um, system. And that um, is about enhancing influenza preparedness and response. Um, so this is to show that the PIP framework was structured the way it was because it was essentially just retrofitted to the existing system um, and the lab network that was already available to it. So we've got um, the standard material transfer agreement that's regulating those national influenza center transfers to the collaborating centers and then anything going to the vaccine manufacturers is under a standard material transfer agreement number two. And these SMTAs mediate a multilateral exchange of access um, for benefits with the WHO as an intermediary. Um, so that fixed all of pathogen sharing and um, genetic sequence data sharing um, and everything was fine after that forevermore. Um, or that's not exactly the case. Um, the point that I really need to emphasize here is that the PIF framework hasn't been tested in a pandemic. So we don't really know whether it's capable of um, sharing those, those tangible benefits like vaccines when a pandemic hits. Um, there's evidence to suggest with the way that countries have behaved during COVID that they probably won't be sharing um, their vaccines readily. Uh, what the PIP framework has done is to increase trust um, and stimulate more countries to share their influenza viruses. Um, so the only problem is we're not sure how long that trust will last if in a pandemic the PIP framework is shown not to be able to provide the benefits that it's promised. Um, in addition to this, the PIP framework doesn't cover genetic sequence data. And um, while influenza virus is a very important virus of pandemic potential, it's not the only pathogen that scientists and pandemic health experts are trying to deal with. Um, so the PIP framework didn't help with the outbreak of the MERS coronavirus in 2012 in Saudi Arabia. It didn't, it didn't help with um, sample sharing when Zika popped up again in 2015. It it didn't help um, mediate transactions of access for benefits when Ebola broke out in West Africa in 2015. Um, and it didn't even help um, when influenza viruses um, that had the potential to cause a pandemic popped up in China. Um, so the 
the fact is that if countries choose not to share their sovereign viruses under the terms of those uh, of the PIP framework under the standard material transfer agreement, then the PIP framework just doesn't apply to those viruses. And countries are free to share them with anyone they want um, under whatever terms they can negotiate. They don't have to share with the World Health Organization. Um, I also want to emphasize, and I realize that I'm starting to go a bit over time, that um, the WHO isn't the only game in town. There's other networks of labs sharing microorganisms all the time. Um, so you've got the World Organization for Animal Health. They have a whole bunch of reference laboratories. They're also sharing influenza viruses from animal um, specimens. Um, then you've even got uh, the OFLU system, which is the animal influenza monitoring system of the World Organization for Animal Health and also the UN's agriculture, uh, Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, so they are sharing animal samples um, between their network of international collaborators and also outsiders. Um, so this is all virus sharing that's happening outside of the WHO system and outside of the purview of the PIP framework, even though they're influenza viruses with pandemic potential. Um, there are even transfers of viruses occurring on purely transactional and commercial terms. So um, there are commercial providers of wild type virus that you can get to work on in the lab as well. So sovereign rights aren't really getting a look in in these instances either. And then there was COVID. So China was very quick to share the genetic sequences of um, the virus in the early days of the crisis, but they were pretty reluctant to share any samples. And I'm not aware of any instances where SARS-CoV-2 samples have left China um, unless they were infecting travellers. The COVID situation has created momentum for um, including amendments to the international health regulations on access and benefit sharing. And there's also proposals in the pandemic treaty to include um, a pathogen access and benefit sharing system that uh, looks like it's been the early uh, versions that uh, have come out in the drafts of the pandemic treaty are looking like this system is going to be based very much on the PIP framework, which, as I've stated, is based on um, the particular characteristics of the influenza virus. Um, so that wraps up the pathogen sharing um, sort of tour. But there's one thing that didn't fit very neatly into this um, presentation because I am talking about the access side of the access and benefit sharing transaction. But there's one point that I'd really like to make, and that's to acknowledge that um, that acknowledging the other work, uh, the, the work of other scientists, um, the collaboration and co-authorship, these are often framed as benefits in the access and benefit sharing transaction, but they're actually just good um, scientific practice and really a basic courtesy. So I just wanted to make that point because I'm talking about access rather than benefit sharing. Thank you to everyone here today and uh, to my collaborators and that's me done. Thank you so much, Michelle. And, and thank you very much for ending on, on pathogen access and benefit sharing because that neatly feeds then into what Mark Eccleston-Turner uh, will be talking about. So I'll pass over to him. Thanks again, Michelle. So yeah, thank you very much. And and before I begin, it's it's just worth pointing out that the 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 comments I'm going to be giving um over the next uh, few minutes are are based on collaboration which I've done over the years with Michelle and with with Steph and also with a a, a PhD student um Abby Hampton. Um, so th this isn't all my own work, and I can't take credit for it. Uh, any of the bits you agree with, that's my work. Any errors are theirs. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, so as, as Michelle sort of said at the end there, um, equity is being very heavily framed within the, the context of the, the pandemic treaty as being around pathogen access and benefit sharing. Uh, and if we return to that, that sort of long list of, of problems we need to solve, which uh, Jean-Luc gave in, in his talk, it's quite a neat solution, right? It solves two of the problems with one go. It solves access to medical countermeasures, particularly in the global south, and it ensures access to pathogen samples for scientific research and development. So it seems like a bit of a win-win. Um, but one thing that, that we argue very strongly is that, that 
pathogen sharing, whether it's bilateral through, through the conventional biological diversity, or multilateral through the pandemic influenza preparedness framework or the pandemic treaty, is a transaction. It's an exchange of a pathogen for a benefit. And these transactional approaches which we have encourage developing countries to use um, their pathogen genetic resources as bargaining chips to ensure enhanced access to, to medicines and, and diagnostics. And it's meant to solve these two concurrent problems, which Michelle outlined and, and Gianluca did as well. Public health researchers need access to medical uh, to um, novel pathogen samples on an ongoing basis. And we need to address and redress the, the huge inequity in, in access to medical countermeasures uh, in the, the global south. And what we've seen through countless pandemic events, uh, including COVID-19, is that rich countries dominate access and supply and leave developing countries to fend for themselves. And what we would believe and what, what we've argued um, over a number of years is that access and benefit sharing links these two problems together, but in a way which solves neither one of them. Um, it's important to set out from the beginning that we, we recognize that ABS and the Convention on Biological Diversity was never just about biological convention. It was supposed to deliver fairness and equity. So that language of equity was there right from the beginning and also redress some of the historic injustices in a post-colonial setting. So the CBD really came out of those, those resolutions around the new international economic order from the General Assembly uh, in the 1970s, and it sort of builds on that. But there has historically been huge injustices uh, in, these, in, these, in this field. So historically, botanists and natural scientists from the global north traveled to the global south and extracted biological resources, plants and animal species, without seeking permission from the local community or the national government. And they essentially saw biological resources of the global south as public goods. And these resources were then expropriated to the global north, where they became private goods and were used in a range of applications from medicine to something beautiful to show off in your home. And these exploitative practices continue to this day when it comes to, to pathogens. You know, we have very clear recent examples which Shell highlighted in um, public health of H5N1, Ebola in West Africa, Zika and MERS. And in arguing against access and benefit sharing, we don't seek to downplay or minimize the, this exploitation at all, not, uh, uh, not at all, but rather to say that the problem which we have framed is the correct one. There is this huge colonial um, injustice which continues to this day. It's just that the solution which we're, we're proposing in ABS is not the right one. Um, ABS has actually done very little to achieve its goals in, in biodiversity conservation or sustainable use of, of biological resources, and it certainly hasn't been able to deliver fair and equitable benefit sharing in environment, international environmental law. And as Shell highlighted in her talk, we certainly haven't seen any evidence of its success in public health. The ABS transaction was a compromise, okay? It was meant to and it is meant to ensure that access to genetic resources occurred using the favored market mechanism of the time, trading your sovereignty um, for access to, uh, access to genetic resources in exchange for benefits and goods. Um, and our concern is that the ABS transaction does not solve any one of these problems. And we're, we're alarmed by the continued push towards using ABS in the, in the public health space that we're seeing in the, the, the pandemic treaty right now. And we're even more alarmed to see it being linked so heavily with the idea of equity, because I would argue that it simply cannot do that and cannot deliver it. And whether bilateral or multilateral, whether done um, between Indonesia and a private pharmaceutical company or done through the PIP framework or done through the proposals in the pandemic treaty. ABS is a transaction. The access of the transaction is that you get access to those sovereign pathogen samples and the benefit sharing is you get access to those private goods such as vaccines, antivirals, and so on. It's a quid pro quo, something in exchange for something else. However, there are a number of problems with this being used in the public health space. First of all, is that bilateral access and benefit sharing means that benefits, vaccines, diagnostics, medical countermeasures, life-saving tools 
accru accrue to those who are best placed to negotiate the agreements for them and not those who will benefit for the most. And they are very often not the same people. While multilateral ABS, such as through PIP and the pandemic treaty, may be better equipped at pooling resources to distribute to nations in need, it's always vulnerable to, to being undermined by nations acting outside of, of these arrangements. And most importantly, the multilateral arrangements which we're proposing don't change the current status quo of high income countries dominating in global supply and purchasing as many far more vaccines than they need for their own populations. Um, what we're talking about here, even if ABS worked, and I would argue it doesn't work and it cannot work under PIP or the pandemic treaty, we're talking about a drop in the ocean of global supply if it worked. We're talking about two and a half percent of, of GSK's ongoing supply being provided to WHO. Two and a half percent. To, which is meant to provide vaccines for pretty much all of the global south who are unable to purchase vaccines on their, their own behalf. Um, another problem that, 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 that comes up with the, the, the ABS system is that um, the PIP framework was meant to ensure that this ABS transaction was brokered in a, a more fair fashion, that the negotiating power between high income and low income was, was mediated and effect, more effectively brokered by WHO. WHO would act as this intermediary party um, to, to, to regulate the, the power dynamics at play here. But the, the, it's very important to remember that WHO is a public health organization. It's not a financial, financial clearinghouse. It is not an effective broker of these, these arrangements. And it, it can only be seen to provide benefits from a multilateral system in a way that accords with public health need. But for a multilateral system to work, provider parties, governments who are incentivized to put their samples into this new ABS system, want benefits to accrue in return for that exchange. If you are a country and you provide samples into this system, you want to get something back in return. And not only do you want to get something back in return, you need to get something better than if you had negotiated that agreement by yourself. Multilateral, multilateral ABS cannot provide that. WHO can only promise the possibility of future benefits accruing to you, not a one-to-one -one exchange of pathogens in exchange for your viral samples. Therefore, the link between the act of providing these samples is too weak to discourage free riding within the systems. Countries can simply elect to not put their samples into the, the WHO ABS system and can still receive benefits in return. So even if you've chosen not to provide samples into the system and you have a public health need, you will get samples back in return. Equally, if you do provide samples into this system, you can't guarantee that you'll get anything back when you are in public health need. If there are other countries with a greater need than yourselves, or there are insufficient vaccines within the system to, to meet your, your need. This destroys the incentives required to ensure that countries are willing to provide samples into the system in the first place, and that the system cannot be undermined by other, other ABS systems like the CBD and the Nagoya protocol that will cut out WHO as a middleman. And this is one of the fundamental issues of access and benefit sharing is it introduces a market for human pathogens. It introduces the dynamics of supply and demand where they are clearly not needed and are not effective. Some viruses will be common and easily accessible and therefore their, access, their value in an ABS pathogen will be minimal. If you think about the COVID-19 pathogen right now, those are in every country in the world of, of every, every version, Delta and Omicron and, uh, uh, and so on. They're, they're readily available. Therefore, their value is incredibly low. Scientists can access them whenever they want from wherever they want. There are multiple sources. But some viruses will be rare and difficult to access, and their value will be comparatively large, providing that's a pathogen that the scientific community wants access to. And a pathogen, the scarcity of a pathogen that makes it valuable in ABS terms is predicated on that pathogen being contained um, just within one sovereign territory or a small number of nations. And in such instances, there are very limited options available to potential users of those resources. If the pharmaceutical industry wants to do research and development on that novel pathogen, and you are the one country that has that pathogen in situ, 
you stand a good chance of negotiating a very good agreement for yourself. Securing benefits for your populations, supply of va vaccines in the future, maybe. However, it's a truism of public health that pathogens do not respect borders. And the moment a pathogen of high value in an ABS transaction crosses the territorial border of a nation and begins to spread internationally, that negotiating position is significantly weakened. And this occurred very recently when Zika hit Brazil in 2015. When this happened, um, researchers predominantly in the US and, and Europe were working on very old samples of, of Zika. And as Shell outlined in her talk, new samples are needed all the time because of this mutation and the way pathogens, pathogens chain. Um, however, when these scientific researchers sought to gain access to samples of the new Zika virus from Brazil, they were met with resistance because um, Brazil wanted to negotiate access and benefit sharing agreements in order for exchange. This was a highly valuable pathogen in terms of the ABS transaction. This was um, a pathogen which the world was getting quite alarmed by. Uh, WHO declared the, the outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. We had the Olympics, um, no, the World Cup coming up very shortly in Brazil. There was a lot of international attention around Zika at the time. Therefore, this pathogen was in very, very high demand. And Brazilian lawyers felt that this was a good opportunity to use access and benefit sharing to secure benefits from high income um, pharmaceutical researchers and scientific researchers in high income nations in exchange for the Brazilian population. As Brazilian lawyers began to negotiate the terms of access and benefit sharing with bodies like the CDC in Atlanta and um, their equivalents uh, in, in Europe, Zika spread from Brazil into Puerto Rico, a U.S. overseas territory, and suddenly the U.S. pharmaceutical industry and the U.S. CDC had access, ready access to samples and didn't need to negotiate an agreement at all. The negotiations with Brazil therefore ended without the transfer of any Zika samples from Brazil and without any benefits accruing to, to the Brazilian uh, government or the Brazilian people at all. And the Brazilian government found out the hard way that your bargaining chip soon disappears once there's a ready supply of um, pathogens from, from other sources. Such are the dangers of pursuing bilateral ABS in a public health emergency. And um, the desire of governments to secure benefits to protect their populations by leveraging one of the few bargaining chips that they have can backfire, leaving vulnerable populations even more vulnerable. And when viewed through the lens of ABS, the most valuable pathogens are the ones that are most rare and the ones that threaten the most lives of uh, the lives of the maximum number of people. This is clearly perverse, and and the supply and de um, demand dynamics of, of market ABS is really not what we need to be dealing with right now. If we have a country that identifies a pathogen which is both novel and threatens the maximum number of lives, we don't want to start calling in the lawyers because as all of us lawyers in the room know, we take a long time and we cost a lot of money. That's not what we need. We need a very fast transfer of that virus into the public domain so scientific research can be done on it. But that can only happen if there are also medical countermeasures flowing back the other way. Therefore, there exists this high um, incentive to come up with a multilateral solution, which is what we saw in the PIP framework and what is being proposed in the pandemic treaty. But as, we, uh, as we've discussed, multilateralism is vulnerable to this un being undermined um, by, by countries who are willing to, to use the bilateral route because they stand to gain more from it. Um, the ABS transaction is often argued to be mutually beneficial. Okay, that's how it's framed. Um, everyone gets something, everyone gets what they want. Countries in the global south who have samples to share now get access to those vaccines which they need. And we, we eradicate the, the, we make sure that samples get into the, the labs where we need them and um, to do the research and, and development on it. However, there are major power differentials at play here when we're, when we're undertaking these negotiations. And what access and benefit sharing does is turn um, providers of samples and, and users of samples into antagonists, into a, sell, a buyer and a seller. 
And often developing countries are not in a position to turn down deals that are seemingly beneficial in the short term, but in the long term might not be that, um, that beneficial. Meanwhile, developing countries like our own and the, our, our industries are often in a better position to make strategic moves and that will secure long term interests. And this is um, uh, as, as, as um, framing, framing, framing these issues as, as being ones associated with access and benefit sharing creates um, medical countermeasures and creates access to vaccines as being benefits and benefits which are only to be allocated to the global south if they purchase them using their sovereign genetic resources, if we get something back in the global north in return. Um, and these are some of the reasons why this sort of market-based ABS solution is just simply not appropriate in the, in the public health space. Um, and up until now, I've sort of given a, a, a sort of fairly strong argument about why ABS is not the solution which we need here. And I think one of the other things to, to bear in mind, and one of the sort of final criticisms I have of this system will lead me into what I think a better route will, will actually be, which is that there is a, a huge human rights argument to be made here, I think. And one of the concerns which, which, which I have is that framing access to medical countermeasures, framing equity as something which is associated with the ABS transaction, reduces equity, reduces access to medical countermeasures, reduces access to life-saving vaccines as something that can be traded for if you are fortunate enough to hold a pathogen of value, rather than viewing equity and access to medical countermeasures as an innate right which all people have, have claimed to, regardless of how much their government happens to have engaged in multilateral or, ABA, um, or bilateral trading of pathogens. Developing countries should not have to purchase fairness and equity using their sovereign genetic resources. And I don't think it counts as equity if you have to purchase it. That is not what equitable redress should be about. Using the ABS transaction in the way that the pandemic treaty does creates a norm or a framing that you're entitled to or you are worthy of receiving vaccines because you've engaged in access and benefit sharing. And I think it distracts from a strong normative basis, even if there's not a strong legal basis of things like the human rights to health and access to medicines under the human right to health. Now that might not be a particularly powerful argument um, within the, the, the present system, but the pandemic treaty offers an opportunity to change the system. That is what this is meant to be about. And we seem quite stuck, not just within um, global health law, but also in the international environmental space on this train of, of ABS. It's important to note that the Convention on Biological Diversity has been in effect for nearly, uh, for nearly 30 years. And it hasn't successfully mediated a single access and benefit sharing transaction, not one, not in the public health space, not in the international environmental space. So why are we still pursuing this system? Why do we think that just by merely tinkering around the edges in the pandemic treaty, changing ever so slightly how we do ABS, but keeping the core being ABS, that somehow things will change. It doesn't work in a health emergency and it doesn't work in international environmental law. Um, and this is one of the, the problems we have with ABS, is that it's presented as a neat solution, right? It fixes two really complex problems it, in one go and ties a nice little bow on the end of it. We don't need to fix access to medicines because we've got ABS. We don't need to talk about IP waivers because we've got ABS. We don't need to talk about manufacturing rights in the global south and transfer of technology because ABS will solve those problems for us. But we have no examples from the public health space or the international environmental space of low and middle income countries being able to use their sovereign genetic resources to broker effective benefits. The only examples we have are negative of this system failing. But even if it worked, right, even if Indonesia um, during during 2005 uh, during 2005 H1N1, let's say they'd managed to negotiate a really good deal. Think back to those words which Michelle highlighted from from Dr. Supari about how unfair the system was and what they were trying to change. Well, great for Indonesia, 
But what about Laos? What about Cambodia? What about any country that doesn't neighbor Indonesia but has just as much need for vaccines as, as, as Indonesia does? Under, under bilateral access and benefit sharing, they get nothing. It's an all or nothing game. All the benefits go to the one country that's able to successfully negotiate an agreement in time. And even then, we don't have an example of it being used successfully. Um, therefore, the solution therefore must be multilateralism. But as we've highlighted, multilateralism is a tiny drop in the ocean. It doesn't seem capable of delivering benefits. And even if it could deliver benefits, it would deliver a, a wholly insufficient number of vaccines, a tiny drop in the ocean, whilst we in the global north continue to dominate 99 or 93% of the global supply for a very small part of the global population. That is what we need to fix. And ABS will not fix that. And ABS is presented as if it is the problem to, to the solution to that problem. Um, and we, we need to think more creatively about how we solve these two concurrent problems. And I think the first thing we need to do is to go back to the fact that these are two distinct problems that require distinct solutions. ABS, whether it's bilateral or multilateral, creates another space where providers and users are antagonists. Their buyers and sellers both seeking to maximize their own gains. But this framing ignores the fact that there are mutual interests here. And the whole point of the United Nations system is to encourage cooperation amongst nations who sometimes have disparate agreements and disparate values. Surely we can start to think outside of the market-based mechanism, which we created in the 1980s through this Convention on Di Biological Diversity, said. Um, and as, as has been noted by, by Jacob, there was and there is a solid normative basis for the expectation that viruses and other pathogens should be shared for the sake of global health. And it's a norm that China upheld to, to some extent, although for very, very different reasons. On the one hand, the world is relying on this norm to be able to respond to infectious disease emergencies, while on the other hand, it's undermining the very same norm with the application of ABS policies. This norm of open sharing can be strengthened and it should be strengthened, but it can only be strengthened if developing countries were not made to feel that ABS was their only opportunity to get access to vaccines and antivirals during emergencies. We should be looking to develop these issues and, and developing solutions in parallel with one another merely solving access to, sol to, to pathogens, whilst not fundamentally addressing access to vaccines, vaccine manufacturing and intellectual property will not solve these problems. But linking the two issues together with a market-based mechanism that was designed to address a market failure in biological conservation, which is what ABS actually is, guarantees that neither of these problems um, will be solved, um, no matter how much we want to, to dress it up as, as a form of equity in the pandemic treaty. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I'm now going to turn to my colleague, Elisa Margera, um, who will now um, be the last uh, speaker uh, before we turn to discuss it. So thanks, Elisa. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, it's been a really interesting conversation. I think we have a lot of points in common. And maybe I should say from the outset, I might be coming from a slightly different perspective as uh, before uh, working on the One Ocean Hub and therefore focusing on uh, human rights and the marine environment. Um, I have for a few years worked on um, benefit, fair and equitable benefit sharing across uh, international environmental regimes, but also across international human rights law. And so maybe uh, what I would like to do is share a few of the findings from my earlier research on fair and equitable benefit sharing, which are still relevant uh, for the ongoing WHO negotiations, um, then share some of the learning uh, from addressing equity issues, including certain forms of fair and equitable benefit sharing under the One Ocean Hub as a direct experience as part of a research collaboration, and then finally, um, uh, collect some thoughts about where I think that still engaging with fair and equitable benefit sharing, as opposed to ABS as such, uh, can be uh, a potentially viable, if not transformative way forward um, for the WHO negotiations. And so maybe before I start, I mean, just to kind of maybe slightly differentiate the points I will make from what the previous presenter just said, I think in my mind, it is important to keep some distinctions um, 
quite uh, at the at the forefront. I mean, the first is that while the Convention on Biological Diversity has so far been interpreted and to some extent applied as um, supporting a bilateral approach to access and benefit sharing from genetic resources, this is not the only way in which it can be interpreted and applied. And in fact, the convention does not preclude a multilateral approach to access and benefit sharing. And we see that in the Nagoya Protocol on access and benefit sharing, we do have a provision that opens up a potential uh, new pathway towards multilateral ABS, even if that path has not yet been taken uh, by parties to the Nagoya Protocol. But the truth is that uh, on the basis of that um, lessons learned in the failures that have been mentioned of the current approach to bilateral ABS, uh, the interest in multilateral approaches, be that under the CBD or the Nagoya Protocol, not just for genetic resources, but also for digital sequence information, I think has become uh, an area of growing interest. Uh, the second point is that um, I would not equate uh, access and benefit sharing as a shorthand for access and benefit sharing approaches and mechanisms with fair and equitable benefit sharing, which across my research I've come to understand as a general principle of international law, a self-standing from access and, access and benefit sharing, even if in the context of the CBD and other international environmental regimes, and also in the law of the sea, we might see it as very often, if not almost paradigmatically linked to access. But even if we read the CBD text, at the start, we see that access is a precondition for fair and equitable benefit sharing. It can also be seen as, as a benefit. Uh, but the point is that the two are not necessarily linked and while we have treaty provisions and other sources in international law that provide for ABS mechanisms, we find a broader notion of fair and equitable benefit sharing across other areas of international law. And I think in particular, the reliance on fair and equitable benefit sharing in international human rights law, I think is quite enlightening in thinking about alternative interpretations of um, fair and equitable benefit sharing, even in the context of those ABS regimes where surely a dominant um, uh, transactional approach has been taken so far. But, but to my mind, that is not a given, it's not the only way to interpret those provisions uh, and including the idea of a market logic, I think it is one interpretative option. I think it has been predominant in the practice, but it is not uh, necessarily a given and it can be challenged. Um, and in fact, it can be given a whole other meaning, particularly if we think across in terms of global benefits, um, deeper forms of international cooperation, which are needed to address challenges such as those of global pandemics but also global biodiversity loss and other global challenges. So I'll start sharing some more specific findings from my research that actually focus on multilateral benefit sharing mechanisms. Uh, partly because um, as has been mentioned, we do not have a very good track record of bilateral uh, benefit sharing approaches. And we also I think for the purposes of the WHO negotiations looking into bilateral, I don't think it's a relevant Point. So what, while I'll agree with um, colleagues that have mentioned before that we do not have yet a fully functional multilateral uh, benefit sharing system uh, across the law of the sea, international biodiversity law, uh, even if we consider the WHO PIP framework, which however has a lot going for it in terms of positive approaches and a very brand new international instrument under the law of the sea, or my on marine biodiversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction, we have learned a lot around how to devise, how to um, shape treaty provisions, um, international provisions on uh, um, benefit sharing mechanisms that take a multilateral approach. And while um, there are certain limitations that have been recurrent, I think there is lot, um, also a lot of lessons learned. And it is interesting to see how those uh, all these international mechanisms have evolved and responded to uh, those limitations, at least to some extent. Um, and I think it is important when, when we think about benefit sharing to divide up the discussion, I think about accruing benefits and distributing benefits. 
Um, and that, you know, that really speaks very much to who are the users? Are they already a part of pre-existing networks? Uh, as Michelle was saying earlier, we have really important pre-existing practices and ongoing practices of sharing um, benefits, sharing um, um, pathogens, and we need to be aware about who is developing and accessing what and what are the lessons learned there, but also what are the power imbalances. Um, across all these different uh, international benefit sharing mechanisms, we have one, I think, of the recurrent challenges, how to ensure the financial viability of the system, even if we expect finance to be uh, gathered and produced by those mechanisms, that has maybe turned out to be one of the most challenging assumptions. And in fact, at the moment, all international uh, multilateral benefit sharing mechanisms rely in some way or other on uh, um, voluntary contributions. And maybe only the WHO framework is a system where we have come up with that annual partnership contribution that moves away from otherwise relying only on governments, um, uh, you know, in their in their um, in their uh, uh, activities as donors. Um, on the distribution of benefits, I think we have learned a lot about not assuming that uh, all sharing of benefits would necessarily contribute to equity. But we've also seen the, the importance of having a multilateral uh, institution that at least looks at where there are gaps, where there are recurrent limitations, where inequities are arising and for whom, and trying to respond to those issues. And across all these four multilateral benefit sharing mechanisms, we see how increasingly uh, multilateral bodies take and are asked to take a brokering role and, um, and a multilateral review role to understand how to best ensure that everyone can truly uh, benefit from a sharing of benefits, that we don't leave gaps. And in fact, we learn from uh, lessons moving forward and, and uh, um, significantly improve, sometimes with small changes, sometimes with well, more significant ones, how we can um, make the system achieve equity at the, at the stage of uh, distributing benefits. I mean, of course, there's a lot of detail here, but this is just to give a, a broad overview. But I guess the key point for my own research on this has been that it is really important to uh, discuss openly the assumptions around fairness and equity. And for all these faults, I think the concept of, of benefit sharing across all the international regimes in which it has included, it has the undoubted, I think, benefit, let's say, to bring up questions of equity to the forefront and have states engage to some extent or other in addressing questions of fairness and equity. Now, to my mind, having looked at many interpretative materials across international law, um, I think maybe the most interesting um, uh, interpretation that I find also particularly emerging both in international biodiversity law and international human rights law is that idea of basically upsetting current um, uh, pol um, power imbalances and really looking at the agency, the active participation of beneficiaries in the identification of benefits and sharing modalities, even if, as we know, a lot of it then ultimately depends on the choices of donor countries. And so in a way, even if the language of beneficiary may, may seem to point to a passive role uh, of those receiving benefits, in reality, um, it is possible to imagine, to understand benefit sharing as something where um, not all benefits will actually be helpful to achieve that fairness and equity objective. Um, the other element is that therefore inherently um, a dialogue between beneficiaries and those uh, and donors or other countries who are in the position to uh, realize that fairness and equity in benefit sharing which needs to be iterative as our understanding of fairness evolves over time and as I said as we have plenty of experience showing how our understanding of what works and doesn't work in attempting to share be um, benefits fairly and equitably uh, goes. Uh, but surely no one-off exercise would do and definitely a top-down approach again wouldn't quite do. And ultimately I think what, what seems the most interesting uh, interpretation of fairness and equitable benefit sharing even if as Gianluca said at the beginning we could see it as a call from the global south uh, to address uh, a series of injustices, current one as well as historic ones. I think that there's really an element of uh, fundamental effectiveness of the treaties and international processes we establish in ensuring fairness um, and equity, because that distrust 
and that incapacity of countries to really work with one another in facing those global challenges where they need resources and collaboration um, essentially speaks about building partnerships and partnerships that go well beyond a mere logic of exchange. Partnership, they also go beyond what we can achieve among states and in fact call for cooperation also with different sets of actors. Uh, but also I think in all the uh, international instruments that engage with the notion of benefit sharing, we really do not look only at a set of bilateral benefits. There's always uh, a broader international objective and in fact a series of global benefits that we expect to somehow be uh, supported by um, benefit sharing. And I think that that's really the core. Can we imagine and have we made progress, even if it's only partial progress, in other international processes about you know, iteratively improving uh, the multilateral approach to benefit sharing in a way that enhances international cooperation towards the production of global benefits through an open dialogue between both procedural and substantive dimensions of um, equity. And uh, as I've worked more and more on this topic, I guess what I've realized is that often we look at the kind of the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of inequity, the inequity that we've all become familiar during the, the global uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But in fact, the issues, the incapacities uh, or the limited capabilities of certain states or actors to address global challenges, again, from global biodiversity loss to global food security to global health security, really need to be addressed much more upstream at the level of research, of knowledge production, which then leads to that capacity uh, to respond, to be prepared, uh, to um, react to global pandemics as well as other global challenges. And so in a way, uh, in my own research at least, I've started to become more and more focused around the very early conditions for fair and equitable benefit sharing, we need to be actually in the area of research and um, fair research partnerships, leading then to all other action uh, for the realization of, of international objectives. So, and, and this is where going back to the issue, where are the human rights, you know, which human rights are, are relevant for the um, WHO negotiations, where I think in addition to the human right to health, which is of course very relevant, we can really rely on the human right to science um, and see how in fact, that human right, which is uh, dates back to the Universal Declaration, but is also very much part of uh, binding global and regional human rights treaties, includes in itself a notion of fairness, fair and equitable uh, benefit sharing, recognizing that while not everyone can contribute to science, all of us need to benefit from scientific advancements without discrimination. And, and it has many other, I think, really important um, sets of elements that help us think through where are the equity challenges uh, in the context of the WHO negotiations, but also elsewhere, and what kind of human rights um, standards and issues we need to take into account to, uh, as Gianluca was saying, human rights proof um, uh, a new treaty. Uh, and really very much, I think, prioritizing the needs uh, for the most vulnerable, which also has then implications for the allocation of public resources um, for research. And I think that in, in my work, at least that um, engagement with the human right to science has really helped to think, and again, find a different uh, interpretation of fair and equitable benefit sharing. The idea of looking at the power dynamics, and again, who's left behind, how we uh, support and need to prioritize the vulnerable, uh, the agency of, of those vulnerable among the beneficiaries, but also assumptions around who produces knowledge and through that um, has then, I think, a, a stronger voice and stronger uh, decision-making power uh, at the level of addressing global challenges. And in a way, really moving away from those assumptions, which are still very predominant about a necessarily global north to global south transfer, be that of capacity, be that of technology or financial resources, as opposed instead to looking at a different framework in which we are mutually building one and another's capacity and co-developing technology that can really make sense uh, in the global north and the global south. And through that collaboration, that deeper sense of mutual collaboration, I think addressing some of the root causes of the inequity that then have um, kind of play out once we are in the middle of a pandemic. 
And it's through that process of um, technological development and mutual capacity building that we all learn around the multiple dimensions of equity. That's how we build trust and how we understand what went wrong, which I think is a crucial point in, in making progress. Uh, and I think ultimately that's really, you know, and the engagement of the human rights to science help us to think also about the notion of, of One Health, which has also been, I think, prominent in the WHO uh, negotiations, but I think still needs to be spelled out in more detail. So I'll, I'll now move on to share a few kind of lessons learned as part of my own experience of engaging with equity issues and, and fair research partnerships as part of a mandate. And in fact, it was a funder's requirement for the One Ocean Hub, which um, as Steph mentioned at the start, it's, um, it's a research collaboration across researchers in the global north and in the global south. Um, we are mandated to, to build uh, and um, iteratively learn uh, fair partnerships among ourselves, but also with actors uh, beyond academia. And while we're not necessarily doing a perfect job, because I don't think anybody does, we have created a system of, of trying to hold ourselves accountable about how we're understanding fairness, how we're sharing benefits, and what we're learning iteratively, and how we can adapt our project to um, the iterative learning. And what's been really interesting has been also working with UN bodies, uh, engaging also and, and, and sharing our knowledge, both with researchers beyond uh, the area of ocean research and interacting with various international processes that have to do with fair and equitable benefit sharing. And just to say that the point of view here was really starting from an understanding of what are the inequities as felt and experienced by our colleagues in the Global South, very much focusing on that entry point into knowledge production as a way to then um, equipping different governments and other stakeholders with better tools to address uh, global environmental challenges as they play out locally, but also as they are addressed at the multilateral level. And fundamentally, uh, the message that we received from our colleagues and our own reflection has been that point of fair research partnerships really going from co-identifying problems co-developing an approach, um, giving fair credit where, it, where it's due, but really continuing the learning um, from planning stage throughout and adapting to that learning and, and developing a capacity to um, learning from one another about those challenges, but also what things seem to work in our partnerships. So how does the experience of researchers um, still um, geared towards uh, contributing to sustainable development speak? to WHO negotiations. I think it has really helped me think through this idea of transformative change that we know is needed to address global biodiversity challenges, but I think also all aspects of the sustainable development agenda. How do we shift away from that alluring idea of fixes? And how do we find solutions that have sustainable impacts across scales and sectors, which I think a, a WHO pandemic treaty might be able to do? Um, and I think that builds on, on some thinking around where well, we need transformative governance from research into other decision making that has to do with, uh, first of all, understanding whose interests have not been met, empowering them to have that voice, that idea of the agency of beneficiaries, preventing a shifting of the burden on those uh, most vulnerable, and this idea of producing knowledge together, particularly recognizing which sources of knowledge have been left out and how we can really work towards including underrepresented systems of knowledge. And so how, how we then took this forward in very pragmatic terms were first of all, and I think this is a point that Gianluca mentioned with regard to the WHO negotiations. We don't have, we haven't had the space and time to really collate the understanding of what went wrong during the global pandemic and how we expect to not repeat the same mistakes uh, through these WHO negotiations. And for the One Ocean Hub, really a critical point was at the start to ask colleagues, what have been the mistakes that we did as we started, but all the other things that went wrong in any other international research collaboration that we're part of, and really capturing that into a co-developed uh, code of practice in our case, where at the very least we had a clear commit commitment to not repeating uh, mistakes from the past. But in fact, we learned much more about where else action was needed um, to 
um, to address issues of unfairness and, and lack of equity. We then make equity an explicit area of research and iterative learning. And so our monitoring and evaluation and learning approach is really focused on equity. We have self-reflexive institutions that help us to work through issues as they come up um, and really look at those issues as, of course, they're challenges, of course, they create tensions, sometimes they create conflict. Uh, and yet we try to engage with them with the idea of like, well, there's a lot to be learned here. And while we may have made new mistakes or somehow fallen back into past mistakes, we need to learn as much as possible to try and transform a conflict into a breakthrough, into a more equitable approach. Um, and that really means also developing the capacity and methods to learn across uh, those areas, including different knowledge systems. Uh, in our case, we've relied quite a lot on art-based approaches, and we've had really interesting conversation with colleagues in international governance and in science about how possibly we're really underestimating the role of arts in supporting more, um, I think, transformative thinking, even in terms of international lawmaking uh, and implementation. And finally, I think this is the key point in terms of One Health. Uh, we no need to think about how the very basic knowledge of how biodiversity works is essential for then thinking about how we respond and prevent pandemics. We know that the COVID-19 did not come up just from health-related issues, but in fact has very much to do with certain global environmental uh, crises we're facing. And so that idea of engaging with biodiversity science and scientists from the fundamental biodiversity research, which explains how life works, how life forms diversify on Earth, to biodiscovery, which is the more maybe advanced uh, down the line form of, of knowledge production related to developing the COVID test or developing vaccines, all of the chain of knowledge production, uh, we need to understand how it interacts with then global governance, be that global health governance, but also how global health governance may impact or be impacting by global uh, biodiversity governance. And that's where the question that um, Gianluca raised about the role of WHO is really crucial. It, we can't expect WHO to regulate the whole biodiversity science and biodiversity governance space, but we need an institution that can is willing and open to engage and find new creative arrangements, I think through regime interaction with other UN bodies to be able to have that overall view, uh, which makes sense both from a One Health approach, but also from a human rights approach, particularly if you think about the human right to, um, to a healthy environment. So moving now on to more specific considerations for the WHO negotiations and kind of bringing home some of this more maybe higher level thinking into the tangible discussions that are occurring in, in Geneva. I think this, the, the key point maybe taking a step back is, uh, can we develop through those negotiations a system of enhanced international cooperation, moving beyond uh, transactional processes, which clearly have created a lot of mistrust and also clearly do not work to uh, maximize global benefits and really thinking about global benefits at, at the outset. And I think for that perspective, the last point around One Health and thinking fully about the biodiversity health, health nexus is essential. Um, at the moment, as far as I understand from colleagues, the One Health negotiations are really focused on particularly on infectious diseases and particularly on terrestrial based diseases. Um, but this should not really limit the scope and the thinking behind the WHO negotiations. We need to think about the environmental drivers of pandemic risks, but also the environmental opportunities to provide responses and really include marine biodiversity. I think one of the, what, no, and the penny drop for me was when there was a media release around the fact that one of the uh, COVID-19 tests had been based, had been developed on the basis of marine genetic resources. And that just shows very clearly to me the importance, the essential importance of thinking across the broad notion of biodiversity science into biodiversity and health governance. Uh, and so that, the idea of learning across regimes, be that the convention of biological diversity, be say the new treaty on marine genetic resources uh, or marine biodiversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction is essential and really think through 
how that knowledge production, these different areas of knowledge can help us to address equity specifically in the WHO negotiations, starting, I think, from the Global South perspective, understanding what has gone wrong, be that in the prevention phase, preparedness, response, or recovery, um, and then responding to that and thinking about a, a um, treaty design that can be both open to that ongoing learning and foster that ongoing learning, and then iterative adjusting to what we learn from one uh, moment to another. Uh, but really, I think each area of prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery may lead to slightly different questions of equity and slightly different responses, because of course, we'll have different time pressures. And I think the effort or that need for fast responses may be truer in some faces, but not others. And again, thinking through these issues in human rights terms, I think the interface between the human right to health the human right to science and human rights to a healthy environment can help us um, think through those issues, not just in um, ethical terms, but in fact, in legally binding terms. So then... Uh, Elise, I'm very sorry, but we're very much sort of coming towards the end, if, if it would be possible just to wrap it up. The, the yes, yeah, no, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so just very quickly, I think it's helpful to then think about fair and equitable benefit sharing as a principle separate from necessarily an ABS approach and thinking about the different roles of states and their obligations to create preconditions and support for fair and equitable accruing of benefits, which I think includes necessarily an obligation to create obligations to create requirements for publicly funded research as well as oversight and, and regulation of private bodies. We have an opportunity in developing a new SMTA or a contract-like system to really think about a mix of benefits, not just limiting to um, accruing, for instance, the um, access to uh, countermeasures, uh, but also thinking about those needs for fair scientific collaboration, which can then really build the capacity for prepare, pre prevention and preparedness in the global south. Um, and really thinking about the role of the private sector and how we can guide that role through those contractual obligations. Um, and finally, thinking about the role of WHO and potentially new international bodies that might be created through the WHO um, negotiations in terms of distribution of benefits, supporting co-identification of responses, uh, co-development of sharing modalities, brokering, uh, and very much shaping that understanding of fair partnerships for global benefits that I think can only come from a multilateral place, but a multilateral place where we move towards participatory governance, where we make specific space for non-state actors, different communities with different knowledge systems uh, across that biodiversity science to biodiversity health governance framework um, to help co-develop solutions in an iterative manner as part of um, a treaty design. And of course, states would have a role to play and, and clarify their duty to cooperate uh, to, that, um, to that end. So thank you so much and sorry, Steph, for going uh, over time. Um, thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank I'm John Harrington. I'm the discussant, and it's a privilege to be here and to respond. Brief. Involve, I think, a, 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 what they've said in context uh, in a longer context. in relation to global health law and governance uh, and global justice. I think what all of the presenters are showing us, uh, as we know, is that uh, COVID was a crisis, has been a crisis for the global health order, for global health law. That's not picking up. Okay, we're okay. Okay, um, yeah, uh, COVID's been a 
obviously a crisis for um, the global health order, global health governance. Um, it's been, and, and therefore out of the crisis comes change. And that's what a number of our presenters um, alluded to or discussed directly. Uh, Gianluca talked about the practical change that's being done in Geneva, the work on uh, the pandemic treaty and the work on the revisions to the international health regulations. Uh, Mark and his presentation pushed this a little, uh, quite a bit further, uh, looking at, a, at the profound change that may be needed or the opportunity for profound change uh, in the ABS system uh, that, that is opened up by this process of reform uh, in response to the in response to the pandemic. And I will come back at the end of my, my brief talk to the question of values, which, are, which were raised in a number of the papers, Marx, and also, of course, Elisa's um, at, at, at the end. Um, the work bears out and uh, confirms an interest of my own in my own research, a distinct focus on the state and states. The work is showing that states matter. States matter and global health. That again seems obvious if we're talking about the negotiation of a treaty. But the, the early days of global health law and governance scholarship in the 1990s, the post Berlin Wall phase, very strongly oriented to the state being superseded or outflanked, not being a, 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 a very significant or a diminishingly significant actor in the field. Uh, and I think all the developments discussed here show that that's definitely not the case. The papers also show us, however, that not all states are equal. So we had much condemnation during the pandemic of vaccine nationalism. Um, important to qualify that, uh, as the presenters did, vaccine nationalism of the global north. Uh, and so it's worth exploring the nationalisms of the global south. Um, the anti-colonial nationalisms, the history of that, which I'll, which I'll come back to in a second. So states differ, and the particular differentiation that we saw here is South and North. All of the presenters talked about Global South, Global North, and this seems to be uh, the, 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 um, the most important, the key explanatory division for what's going on in Geneva, what was happening with Indonesia, uh, the past, the origins, and the future of, of the ABS and in, in Elisa's ethical reflections as well. And all of those um, uh, elements, those moments show us, and indeed the pandemic showed us, that, that states are not only matter, they not only matter, they're not only different, but they're unequal. Uh, and that inequality, that inequality matters, that inequality is traceable to history. So we must look to history again, as was alluded to, um, to understand those differences, to understand motivations, to understand context, and the key historical element, Mark mentioned it by name, is colonialism. Um, colonialism is important, um, not simply in terms of exploitation, resource extraction, which are relevant here. The, um, the question of indigenous knowledges, for example, which borders on this area, Colonialism also matters in relation to states, the states that, that we have today emerged across the global south out of decolonization processes. And the new international economic order, which was mentioned, uh, was a moment of decolonization for states in the global south. Uh, an attempt to exercise sovereignty over resources, an attempt to reshape the global system through the United Nations, an attempt which ultimately failed, which was defeated actively by the states of the global north, uh, which, which, which uh, as I've argued in a recent paper, uh, involved disciplining those global south states, uh, imposing financial discipline, imposing accountability and benchmarks, limiting those states, uh, putting security limits on them, policing failed states, and, and so on and so forth. So we have, a, we have an example in the, in the 60s and 70s of, a, of a, 
a response from the global south against an unjust uh, colonially derived order in health. This played out at the World Health Organization, uh, but in other fora as well. Uh, uh, an attempt which was defeated and which led to the patterns of global health governance, I would argue, that I mentioned, that I mentioned earlier. Um, in some senses, COVID, uh, the crisis of COVID has represented a, a crisis of the legitimacy of that global health order, of the, the order that followed the uh, new international economic order, a crisis of global health governance, a crisis of the universal values that were meant to underpin it, things like the right to health, things like solidarity, which uh, are very strong in principle, are well argued, but clearly did not have the purchase that, the, that, that was expected of them when it came to access to vaccines, when it came to uh, lockdowns and, 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 and travel restrictions. Uh, and out of that crisis comes those treaty negotiations, the pandemic treaty negotiations in the international health uh, regulation revisions. And within that context, we see a further phase, a new phase, a more assertive phase from the global South states. Um, again, Gianluca mentioned this prominently in relation to the course of negotiations and what's driving them uh, at, at, at Geneva. Coalitions, the African Union, for example, pushing agreeing positions, uh, the a common but differentiated responsibilities, the uh, as, as a proposed term of the pandemic treaty, the greater emphasis on solidarity, the maintenance of equity and the continued uh, emphasis on sovereignty. Why are we seeing this greater assertiveness? Well, as I've said, there's a crisis of legitimacy in the global health order. There is an element of returning to the new international economic order. There are wider trends like the move away from uh, a unipolar order of the post, uh, post Cold War phase where the United States were dominant, global South states have more options. Intellectual currents like the decolonized movement have got us all thinking, uh, but particularly people in and from global South states about these unfairnesses that we, that we have been discussing today. Um, and so if we look at this in terms of values, um, uh, and, and sorry, the last point, I would pick up on a, an important phrase that Elisa used, agency, the agency of global South uh, states and actors in this context, the assertiveness, uh, which is a returning feature, which had lain dormant, if you like, from the end of the new international economic order through the post-Cold War phase until relatively recently. We have a, a strong body of scholarship reflecting on African agency in international relations and how that's playing out in the health context and COVID pathogen sharing, the pandemic treaty more broadly has given us context for that. So I think uh, particularly looking at Elise's presentation, we've got three really key values at play here, solidarity, uh, equity and sovereignty. Um, and this is also thematized in the paper that, that Mark spoke to. Um, with equity, we've seen uh, a degeneration at least, Mark talked about the, the, the move to a more, a contractual view, a reciprocal view, a bilateral and impoverished view of equity, which seems to sustain or be implied in the ABS system. Uh, Counterposed to that is an idea of solidarity, is a cosmopolitan idea founded on the right to health, a shared, uh, shared rights, shared interests, and that particularly registers, I think, at the level of the individual. All people around the world are entitled to uh, protection, uh, a reasonable go at getting vaccines, and so on and so forth. The last value, as I've mentioned, uh, and, and Elisa spoke very eloquently, I thought, about integrating that value into her research practice, uh, into the work of her, of her, of her transnational research 
community. The last value I pick it up again is the idea of sovereignty, which is stated clearly in the draft pandemic treaty. Sovereignty was viewed, tends to be viewed in global health uh, negatively as a break and a barrier to progress towards these cosmopolitan values. But perhaps we should dwell on it a little, perhaps we should think a little more about uh, some of the positive aspects of the assertion of sovereignty in a context of unequal stakes. Now, I, uh, I think Mark and Michelle have both shown us in their presentations uh, the limits to sovereignty, the inability of states to, uh, for example, keep the pathogen within a single border. Uh, it's not possible to close off an economy, it's not possible to close off um, biology, if you like, uh, in, 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 in that particular way. I think some of the limits to sovereignty are also posed by inequality. Uh, uh, Jan Lucas' paper talked, of, you know, implicit in that is the continued importance of the United States. We were just uh, mentioning that the significance of the US electoral cycle to the timing of the negotiations between over a hundred sovereign states. So I don't want to overplay sovereignty, but I think it's an important resource. I don't think we can go fully back to the new international economic order. It failed in, in several ways, uh, being defeated from the outside, but also due to internal factors. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's an important value to keep in, in play. I think I've said my piece, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, John, and, and thank you very much to each of our speakers. I think it's been a fascinating session, and I think we could speak all night um, on this very topical issue. Um, we do have a very limited amount of time for questions. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the Bickle staff for some guidance in terms of how much time we have. Um, if you are joining us online, obviously, please feel free to pose any questions or comments you have for the panel in the Q&A. Um, and we'll do our best to get through them. But I think at this juncture, I'll pass to anyone in the room who has any questions, if you can raise your hand um, and introduce yourself. So I'll start with you, if you can uh, get a microphone first and introduce yourself um, and we'll pass it to the relevant panel. Uh, thank you um, for such excellent presentations. Uh, my name is Judith Buonaskita. I'm a senior lecturer at Essex Law School and Human Rights Centre. Um, and my, my question really gets at the relationship um, between equity and human rights. Um, and I, I suppose that, I, that what I find curious is this kind of pursuit of equity in, in these negotiations um, under the pandemic treaty, at the same time <laughs> as more or less the same states are um, seemingly frustrated with the limited impact um, of the Paris Agreement and the climate change regime and are now um, looking to international human rights law and concepts, international cooperation, obligations of international cooperation, um, you know, and looking for advisory opinions in the inter-American system at the International Court of Justice um, and also obviously civil society, rights holders have activated um, the system through um, litigation at the international level um, and domestic and regional levels as well. So I don't know whether you've got any thoughts about why, um, you know, the same uh, demands sort of being framed in terms of equity under the pandemic treaty uh, accord, sorry, um, and, and, and then under human rights um, treaties um, and uh, the, um, in relation to climate change. And one, I suppose one reflection about that is, is, is it because the nature of pandemic um, responses and um, the sort of convenience <laughs> um, that many states have found in limiting human rights? Um, so is this part of a sort of broader issue to do with human rights? Thank you. So I'm I'm happy to to talk on that one first. Um, so thanks, Judith. It's it's such a an interesting and important point, and and I think that there are a, a couple of answers to it. The the cynic in me would say that that's a very deliberate tactic that that um, states are seeking to make equity 
the language of a, a catch-all for good. Um, and it can mean so many things to so many people because equity doesn't have a clear definition. Equity doesn't have a clear definition in international law. It means many things to many people. It means many things to many different regimes. Um, whereas human, and therefore, because of its because of its universality, it becomes almost meaningless. Whereas human rights and links to human rights language therefore taps you into you know, a, a, a 70 years of jurisprudence at the international and domestic level with clearly defined um, uh, obligations attached to them. It taps you into things like the treaty bodies, the universal periodic review, it taps you into much more formalized methods of accountability um, Whereas the language of equity makes it sound like you're working towards all of those good things that, of course, we would be working towards, but without any of the sort of formal structures and and, and associated understandings of, of, of what they actually mean. I do think that it's also a, a sort of quite concerted political effort as well, because there are some countries who would just run 100 miles away from, from this instrument if the language of human rights were included in it. They're also the same countries who are running 100 miles from it whenever we talk about meaningful equity and what it actually means. But I think that that it's a, it's, it's a sort of a, a political decision to try and get some countries to try and agree to, to, to this thing. But that brings you back to the question of, well, if it waters down so much and that it becomes fundamentally meaningless. What's the point of agreeing to this in, in the first place? So I think that the, the complete lack of, of, of human rights language in the drafts which we've seen, both, seen so far is really quite alarming. Um, so Jean-Luc and I have written a paper previously um, where we talked about the fact that the human rights language in the international health regulations isn't strong enough. At least it's there. At least there's a bit of it to start with. I mean, there is there's literally nothing in this treaty that that references human rights. And when you think about the really formalized systems and structures and jurisprudence at domestic and international level, which we've got to ground and define and and push some of these concepts on, we're sort of totally ignoring that. And it's it's yeah, I think that there are sort of political reasons why that is being done, but it certainly isn't making for a better instrument. Thank you, Mark, and, and thank you, Jude, for your question. Um, does anybody else in the room have any questions or comments? Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll give you the microphone first. Oh, hi, thank you. Uh, it's like a very uh, insightful like lecture to know uh, different perspectives. Uh, I'm Aris, I'm currently studying at SOAS uh, in a master program at Gender Studies and Law. And I probably have a question to Dr. Michelle, <laughs> because like when you are uh, introducing the thing, I noticed like you talks about a one health approach. I know like uh, no matter pandemic or whatever, for sometimes like we probably will face the same uh, public health crisis. But um, would you mind to how to say elaborate more about one health approach because when I say it, how I understand, like I would think more about, for example, local context. Like even though we face the same pandemic, but like when it comes to different countries or regions, I feel like you know, it's like it's different. And also, uh, I feel like when it, um, there is no gender perspective, I feel like for women or men or like when we face the same health issue, even for the vaccines, like I think the like the if impacts on like different groups of people are different. So like I'm quite curious about that. Thank you. Thank you very much for the great question. Um, you're right, this is about a One Health approach um, and I did kind of dance around it in my presentation, but a One Health approach is about um, looking at um, human health, not just as a human health um, issue. So humans don't act in isolation. We interact with animals and we interact with the rest of the environment. So. A One Health approach is about looking at the health of the environment and the health of animals and making sure that um, we approach all of those elements uh, as a way to um, look at infectious disease threats and deal with infectious disease threats. Um, your 
you're totally right. It's completely contextual. So we can talk about a One Health approach, but it's not a one size fits all thing. It has to change depending on the local context. Um, if I can recommend a book that you might like, um, it's called Viral Economies by Natalie Porter. Um, it's a wonderful book um, that shows uh, influenza virus management uh, by veterinary uh, practitioners and also human health practitioners in Vietnam. Um, highly recommend it. And I think um, I'm hoping that you'll find uh, some, some references to um, gender within that as well. I can't really speak um, to gender within the One Health approach, but um, again, it is a contextual thing. And I think um, that, yeah, all of those elements do need to be taken into account. Thanks for your question. Thanks so much, Shell, and, and thank you very much for the question. Does anybody else in the room have any additional comments or questions? Yeah, okay. So thank you so much for this uh, really interesting set of papers. And my question is also uh, for Michelle, although with apologies for asking at four o'clock in the morning. Um, but I, um, but it's actually one that is that speaks to things across the panels, which is the way that the uh, one of the issues with this way that sovereignty is attempted to be negotiated is that it often um, seems to operate as if the map of the world is set and fixed and will not be modified, right? So the access and the benefits, so the people who need the access of the pathogens, we know exactly where they are, they are in only particular countries, those will be the countries that will be making scientific knowledge. And then we know exactly who the beneficiaries um, who will be in need will be, those will be in different countries which will remain in this hierarchical relation after the encounter of this exchange, right? Um, but there were hints about ways that it might change. So um, for example, in Elisa's uh, paper, she mentioned about how, well, not everyone will contribute to science, but everyone needs access to the benefits. But yet even in your presentation, you highlighted the ways that actually we need to keep the barriers to the ability to contribute to scientific knowledge making, we need to lower those, right? Um, and then uh, in Michelle's, this idea about co-authorship of sciences, you know, so the ways that um, global North scientists often fail to recognize the contributions of the global South scientists with which they collaborate. Um, and um, that actually those kind of more equitable authorship relations are part of recognizing that there is no kind of global hegemony on the capacity to generate novel knowledge. Um, and that we can make those processes more equitable in ways that might also have impacts both for science and for global health. Uh, thank you so much for a multifaceted question. Um, I think uh, I liked your point about the map of the world being fixed. Like that's how we talk about it when we're talking about sovereignty and um, John mentioned that we behave as if biology has borders, but it but it really doesn't. Um, I think one point I want to make, just sort of jumping off your question rather than answering it directly, um, is that when we're talking about viral sovereignty, um, we're using concepts from the Convention on Biological Diversity, like the country of origin, and it's not very clear what that means for viruses. Um, so we're talking about, are we talking about the country of evolutionary origin? Are we talking about the country um, that the virus emerged within? Or are we talking about uh, the country that the virus was isolated within? Um, these are all aspects of, um, of scientific knowledge generation that um, need to be recognized in accordance with the Convention on Biological Diversity. So part of acknowledging scientific contribution is if a country has um, had its scientists um, isolating viruses and putting their public health practitioners in positions where they're in danger and are responding to a dangerous virus outbreak or pathogen outbreak, um, and then collecting 
the samples, generating the data, putting that online, that all needs to be acknowledged and feed into the global generation of scientific knowledge. Um, and, and as I was saying, I don't, I really feel that this should just be a matter of scientific courtesy that um, these inputs are acknowledged, um, but it's hard to know how far uh, down the line, so how far um, upstream do you go um, to acknowledge the the sorts of um, knowledge that you're building on top of? So, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, um, but there, there are lots of giants stacked on top of each other. Excellent. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you for the, the great question. Um, we are absolutely at the limits of time, but there is one interesting question that we've had in the q and I think most of the other Q&A um, questions have been answered already. Um, but I'm going to pose this to Jean-Luc. Uh, will there be a treaty body to monitor compliance with the treaty? Well, that depends on the final outcome. In the text as it stands now, uh, there is quite an elaborate set of, of governance institutions. There's a conference of the parties with various subsidiary bodies, uh, including one on compliance, uh, with a long list of functions um, to both promote effective implementation and to have a rather non-antagonistic, non-adversarial approach to compliance. So um, I think if you look at the texts that have come out since, uh, since last year, there is a growing attention to the question of compliance or promotion of implementation and of mutual accountability. Uh, this clearly reflects um, a clear understanding on the part of many countries, both global north and global south, that you need that kind of mechanism to build trust, to ensure mutual learning, uh, to have a more credible outcome. So again, depends on the final outcome, but I'm pretty confident that there will be a kind of mon compliance monitoring mechanism that resembles to a certain extent what you see in some multilateral environmental agreements. You also have proposals on compliance mechanism um, in the amendments to the IHR. In particular, there's one from the Africa region, one from the United States, quite elaborate, and one from the European Union. And there you can see a tension between <clears throat> two approaches. One which is the one in different directions by the African group and the European Union, uh, want a political peer review, want basically states reviewing states, a bit along the line of the human rights UPR, uh, in one case even grounded within the health assembly, so like a, like a plenary uh, review that, of course, weakens very much the idea of a proper, more pointed compliance review, becomes more of a political exercise, more of a promotion exercise, uh, so high-level review and so on. On the other hand, the United States wants a an expert body, more akin to, again, what you see in many regulatory uh, treaties. So you see a number of directions, but you see quite an attention to the need for, uh, again, non-adversarial, fairly supportive, but credible uh, compliance mechanism in both texts. Thank you very much, John Luca. Um, so it's it's my pleasure to act like the groom at a wedding, which is just to issue final thanks um, to everybody. Thank you very much to each of our speakers. You've been incredible. Um, I find this fascinating and um, I think, you know, having judged um, the audience in the room's um, active participation and concentration, I, I can say the same for everybody who's been um, here and online as well. Um, I want to thank Bickle um, and in particular Anthony for all his help um, in getting this together as well as our AV support and also um, Finally, I'd like to thank the Royal Society of Edinburgh for the funding to enable this um, event to take place. But I think unless there's anything else, I think that is us. So thank you very much, everybody, for attending. And yes, have a good evening or good morning if you're Michelle. <laughs>